Good morning. Welcome to the bridge. We're happy that you all are here uh, today. It's good to see everybody um, as we celebrate Palm Sunday and what that re represents for us. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, we continue our penny crusade. Uh, I meant to get a total so far, but I forgot to put that on the screen. But uh, we've got uh, next Sunday is our last Sunday for that collection. So if you are interested in supporting uh, Penny Crusade, um, just keep that in mind. Uh, this evening, we will be hosting the um, quarterly Singspiration, quarterly, biannual. I don't know how often it is now, but <laughs> tonight at 6 o'clock, be here. Um, if you are helping set up, or um, then please be here about 5 or 5.30 at the latest. Um, so that'll be this evening. Um, also, if you brought uh, some treats or snacks for tonight, uh, make sure that we know where they are in the fellowship hall because we'll pick up the balance this afternoon. Uh, coming up in September uh, is our concert in the park, we think. We're not sure. We, uh, the location is TBD at this point. So we'll keep everybody up to date and get our website updated too. Uh, as soon as we know more on that, we'll let you know. Um, next Sunday is Easter, and with that, we're doing the butterfly release and the egg hunt. So as far as the egg hunt, today was the deadline to bring in the trinkets and the candy and stuff. So are we doing okay, Pam? Okay. So, uh, but there is still volunteer sign-up sheets out there. I think we still need some help. Uh, if you want to fill the eggs, you want to hide the eggs, you want to help uh, hand out the gifts at the end or the trinkets. Um, all kinds of help is needed because we'll probably have a pretty good sized crowd next week. Um, and if you are interested in getting a church t-shirt, uh, they are out on one of the tables out there. They're $25 a piece. Um, so there's a little can out there you can put your money in. Um, and then this Wednesday night, the ladies will not be meeting for Bible study. So Ladies, keep that in mind. I think that's all of our announcements. So let's go ahead and stand. We'll open in prayer as we begin our time of worship. Dear Lord, we are uh, so thankful to be in your house this morning. Um, as we uh, celebrate Palm Sunday and what that means, uh, your triumphal entry, uh, your uh, sacrifice, uh, and your resurrection, our living hope. Uh, we just thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done, the plan of salvation that you've set in place uh, to, um, to make us your sons and daughters. Just be with us now as we worship you. Uh, just uh, help us to focus totally on you as we sing, uh, as we hear your word. Help us to uh, uh, take it in in our hearts and our ears and help us to apply it to our lives this week. We just ask a special blessing on you. Uh, Pastor Chris, as he brings the message. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. There's no space that we love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave my side. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I am holding on. I am. 
Oh 
may be seated. And the kids are excused to go to Bridge Kids. And we'll watch our Penny Crusade video and then turn it over to Pastor Chris. Esther Rama is a 46-year-old wife and mother of three who lives in one of the rural villages surrounding the Adder Road Advent Christian Church. Initially, her life was immersed in a terrible spiritual darkness. I used to worship tribal gods, and I used to believe in superstitions, black magic, and idolatry. To worship tribal gods was my family background and the culture I was in. Her life began to change when her husband became very ill and doctors could not find the cause of his sickness. It was in this time of hopeless desperation that she turned from worthless false gods to the true and living God. After some time, my husband got sick and we took him to the hospital. The doctors could diagnose nothing wrong with him. Every hospital and doctor said that there were no physical problem, but inside his body, he had some weakness caused by a demon and the doctors could not find it. We believed in idols and superstition and tried to find help in those things, but they did not help change the situation. I heard that Jesus Christ could heal him, and I believed in Jesus. Things went from bad to worse for Esther Rama and her family. Her husband's health declined even further, but she found help and support in her church family. My husband became like a lunatic with a disturbed mind, and we all thought he would die soon. We believed that Jesus could heal him, so he took him to the church and to the pastor. My husband moved into the church, and after one week, he was delivered from the demon, and he became a Christian. Because of financial problems, family problems, and health issues, her family accumulated a great deal of debt. They owed eight lakh, or the equivalent of about $10,000. This was an almost insurmountable debt, in a country where the average salary is around $400 per month. Our neighbors were saying that we could not live in the village. Our creditors would come and take our home. All of our neighbors who believed in tribal religions and superstition criticized us. Fearful of losing all her family had, Esther Rama once again turned to the God who had delivered her family from hopelessness once before. I made a covenant with God at the Calvary Mountain. Everyone was saying it is hopeless, but we have faith in you. We are going to find new work. We will come back after one year. Father, if you bless us financially to repay this debt, we will share the testimony. We will testify to your blessing. We will praise your name to everyone in my village. After moving nearly 300 miles from home and after one year of hard work as laborers at a brick factory, Esther Rama and her husband returned home. Miraculously, God sufficiently provided and all of the eight lakhs debt was repaid within one year. Last month, I shared my testimony at Calvary Healing Mount because of the covenant I made with God. God has helped to sustain us in every way and I will stand and testify of His goodness. I can now stand courageously in my village and testify that God has provided for me. He is Jehovah Jireh providing sufficiently all we have need. So I will testify to everyone how God has blessed me. Good morning. It's an amazing uh, account that she shared. Uh, it's actually the first time I've heard that one. Um, when I think about it, it sounds like something straight out of Scripture that you would read. And the, the cool thing about that is that even though the events that took place in Scripture may be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the past, the God of the Bible is still the same today. So when we really think about it, we don't have any reason to believe He would be any different in how He delivers His people, how He moves in people's lives. And that's exciting. Uh, before we get into our study for this morning, let's take a moment and uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to meet together in your presence, to study your word, 
that your spirit can speak to our hearts. That, Lord, you are the same as you have always been, Lord. Your, your power is not lessened. Lord, your ability to move in our lives and do miraculous things is not decreased. Lord, we ask that as we study your word together this morning, that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and minds, calling us closer to you, growing us up to be the body of believers in our community that you have called us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we've been studying in the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, next week we'll take a little break from that for uh, Easter. But today we're going to be finishing up chapter 7 of uh, 1 Corinthians. And uh, if you remember last week, we noted that uh, there was kind of a switch in how Paul was addressing them. Prior to that, he had heard about concerns that he was writing to them to uh, deal with, things that uh, had been reported to him that he was worried about. And then last week we switched to him covering a letter, the letter we don't have available to us, but they had written him questions about different topics. How do we handle this? What's going on with this, etc. And so uh, Paul is in the middle still of answering the questions that they had addressed to him. Now, you may notice as we read the section that we have for today that it can seem a little confusing. <laughs> it did to me when I was reading it. And uh, because he, he covers several different things as he works his way through here. And what I think you'll discover as we look at it is there are a couple of keys that we can pull out of what he's saying to use in our understanding of the overall, like all the topics that he's talking about. And so kind of keep your eyes open as we go through uh, the passages to see what it is he's, he's communicating at the core to the Corinthian believers. Um, it also would be helpful to remember as we read this that, as we said early on, the Corinthian believers had all the little factions that they were dividing into. And remember, they, were, they, they had the status issue going on, and uh, they had the worldly wisdom attention going on, and they, they had divided themselves, and they, they were about, well, this is better, and I'm better, etc. And some of that uh, is probably playing into some of the questions that come up in this next section, so kind of keep that in mind as well. So we'll start out in uh, verse 1, sorry, in verse 17 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it says, only as the Lord has assigned to each one as God has called each, in this manner let him walk, and so I direct in all the churches. And so in the middle of his uh, question and answer time with the Corinthians, he is pointing out, okay, so this is what I direct all of the churches, that as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. Walk a lot of times in Scripture is used to describe how we live our lives. And so the key to pull out of this section is as the Lord has assigned to each one. Now, assign in the, the Greek, when I looked that up, it can mean assign responsibility, give to a particular task. So think about that. We started in the beginning of Corinthians talking about uh, where Paul reminded them they were called to fellowship. And here, not only does it talk about called, but it talks about this assigning, this, this God calling someone in a unique kind of way. And as uh, we move down through the next few verses, he's going to cover several different circumstances where he shows how that plays out. So the first one that he's going to use as an example is uh, circumcision. And he says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. And what uh, is believed was happening is along the lines with the whole factions and the status stuff. Well, here's the question. Who's more spiritual? The believer that was circumcised prior to becoming a believer or the believer who's not circumcised? Should the believer that is not circumcised be circumcised so that he becomes a, a higher status Christian? 
Does it make a difference? What's going on, right? And Paul says, in, in essence, neither of them have a higher status. If they were uncircumcised prior to becoming a believer, that was how they should remain. If they were circumcised prior to becoming a believer, that was how they should remain. That what mattered, the end of verse 19, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. And that's kind of our second key as we look through what he's saying, and even as we think back about what he was saying in the the first part of 7 that we read through last week. These are kind of the, the, when you look at the different circumstances, these are the things that were used as determining factors in how someone should behave and what they they should do. Uh, And then he moves on to his next example, which is the example of slavery. So it's almost as if they were asking the question, well, is someone who is a free man a higher status as as a believer than someone who's a slave? I mean, slaves did not have a lot of rights in, in, in that culture. And so... Is a free man a better, better Christian? Are they a higher level of Christian than a slave? Is it better one way or another? Like, how does this work? And so Paul says, were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. So, who has higher status, the free man or the slave as a Christian? Neither. He kind of levels that, that, that field for them. In Christ, the free man was the slave of Christ and the slave was a free man. There was, they were equal. So, when they looked at their, their congregation, and you had maybe one member that was a slave. And if you think about it also in that culture, it, in America, I think maybe our default idea of slavery is what happened uh, around the Civil War era of our nation's history. But slavery in ancient times, it could be slavery similar to that. It could be slavery because you had a debt and you had been sold to pay off your debt. There were different ways that people came into that. And so, if you had, they had a slave in their congregation and a free man, which one's, which one's better? Kind of like with their discussions of, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Christ, I follow Cephas. Well, neither. And Paul points out, you know, if, if they're able to get free, if they have a chance to obtain their freedom, they pay off their debt, something along those lines happens, by all means, take advantage of that. There, you, you have more freedom in what you do, but they don't have to get worked up about it. If you're in this position and Christ has called you to be a believer, you are the same status as all the other believers because it really comes down to keeping the commandments of God and what God has assigned you, that calling on your life. If you're doing those things, if you're hearing God's voice and you're obeying it, and you're obeying His teachings, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't matter whether you're a slave or a free man. You're doing what matters. What is important is what's happening. And so, this is what He's telling them. And then He goes on, and He's going to give a final word on marriage. He spent a little while last week talking about that. And in verse uh, 25, He's going to kind of return to that topic. And so he says, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. So again, he's not referring back to maybe a specific teaching uh, that Jesus had given here, but he has, he has an opinion about the matter that he wants them to take seriously and think about, give, to give due consideration to. And so starting in verse 26, he says, I think then that this is a good view in the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none." 
And those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. So let's think back to the context of all the other issues that he's talked about. So as a believer in the church at Corinth, who had the higher status, the single person or the married person? Was one a better Christian? In, in some circles, maybe, maybe from the Jewish portion of the believers, there might have been a little bit of concern there because for the Jewish person, getting married was almost a part of their identity. Like they, they believed that it was important for them to do. Um, almost to the point uh, in some of the stuff that you read that they believed they were sinning or disobeying if they didn't. So if you think about those mentalities that might have been around, which one's better? And Paul's saying that at the present time, if my, there we go, at the time he wrote this letter, there was a situation of distress that was afflicting the Corinthian believers. And this was what Paul considered to be a determining factor in, in one of them, in his opinion. He believed if they were currently single or currently married, they didn't need to change it. Stay as you are. Don't make big life changes. There's this going on, and it, it is, uh, it's troubling. And he wanted to spare them extra trouble. Um, and he, he points that out starting in verse 32. He says, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord. How may he please the Lord? But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So, if you take it all together, his two concerns were undivided attention. He wanted them to be able to give undivided focus to the work of the Lord, and he was concerned about the things that they were facing. Now, he points out to them that being married wasn't a sin. So, if there was, especially if you think back to what he was saying earlier in chapter 7, if they were there and they wanted to get married, they weren't sinning. But at the same time, there were considerations he wanted them to be aware of. There were things he wanted them to think about and, and go into with their eyes wide open. And one of them is marriage is a time-consuming engagement. If you stop and think about it, relationships take effort. They take work. Good relationships don't happen by accident. You don't just kind of trip into a good relationship, do nothing to maintain it, and everything's cheery and happy all the time. They take effort. They take work. They take concentration. <laughs> And when you think specifically about marriage relationships, frequently those mean that there are going to be children at some point. Children take time. Children take focus. Children take concentration. <laughs> they take effort. And Paul's thought here is if, they, if the Corinthian believer felt that, they, that God wanted them to do something ministry-wise, the work of the Lord, they needed to keep in mind that family considerations can make those things complicated sometimes. They had, you could have a divided focus because not only were you, did you have that calling where you needed to follow what the Lord was telling you and be involved in the, in the work for the Lord that He was asking, but you also had a responsibility before God to care for your family. They were both important things and they both took time. And so His estimation was you ended up with a divided focus. Was it a sin or wrong? No. But don't enter into it unaware. And so, given these things, he's not saying marriage is bad, marriage is wrong, you shouldn't get married. That wouldn't exactly fit with some of what he had said in the earlier part of chapter 7, but he is saying be aware of the circumstances. Remember in uh, last week when we looked at the earlier part of 7, he said, know yourself essentially. When he was talking about uh, living in immorality and getting married and all that, know who you were, know what God had called you to. And so here, he's just kind of carrying on that same thing, 
And we think about those two keys, as God has assigned to each, and keeping the commandments of God. They come into, they come into play here just as in anything else. What has God called you to? And as I think about that, we may end up with this, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use, inaccurate perception sometimes that the only believers that get called are the people that get called into ministry. Well, you were called to be a pastor. Well, you're called to be an evangelist. Well, you're called to be this. Well, you're called to be that. Well, the truth of the matter is if we're a believer, we're called to something. Not only are we called to fellowship, but God has a plan for our lives. There's a unique calling on us. Now, it may not be a calling to pastor a church. It may not be a calling to what we would think of as formal ministry. But all of us have a calling. All of us have something unique that God is, is calling us to in His body. And Paul talks later in Corinthians about gifts and, things and, and, and the work of the Spirit and that. But if you stop and think about it, do, do we think as believers about that? Do we go, what, what is God calling me to in my life? Not just, well, I'm a believer and God has forgiven me and I am, I'm grateful and I'm thankful for that and I have a new life, and I have the hope of a bodily resurrection. And now I just go on about my life, and one day I'll realize the rest of those things that God has given me. What is God calling me to now in my life as I live it? Do I, do I take into consideration the moving of the Spirit and the calling of God in my decision-making, or do I kind of relegate it to that supposed spiritual area of life segregated from what I would consider my normal everyday physical portion of life, because there really is no separation. When we give our heart to Christ, when we become believers, God saves all of us. Our mind, our heart, our body, all of us are called into this newness of life and this newness of relationship. And so when we consider our decisions, when we consider the directions that we choose to go in our life, God's assigning, God's calling on us is an important consideration. And that's what Paul's pointing out to them. What is it that God is calling you to do? Was God calling them to get married last week or was God calling them to be single? What is it God's asking you to do and are you doing that? And then he moves on for his last portion of this section and he says, but if any man thinks Say a little more about marriage. If any man thinks he's acting unbecomingly towards his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let him marry her. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then both who, he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. Okay. The translation's weird, all right? I looked in several different translations because I'm like, all right, I want to understand what this says. And if you look in the NASB, uh, a tool they will frequently use is italics. If they have a word italicized in the New American Standard, it's not a word that they have a direct Greek equivalent to. They've kind of inferred a meaning. So I looked up the uh, CSB, and the CSB phrases verse 36 this way, if any man thinks he's acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, if she is getting beyond the usual age for marriage and he feels she should, he should marry, he can do what he wants, he is not sinning, they can get married. Sounds a little different. Now, this is what I dug up. This is the best of my understanding. You have two valid options here. Either A, we're talking about people who have, uh, who are engaged, they're planning on getting married, and Paul's essentially saying it's okay if they want to go ahead and get married. They need to make the decision, they need to know what they're doing, and not feel compelled to go one way or another by other people, but they're okay to go ahead and get married. The other is, it's addressing, the other thing that uh, came up as I was looking, they're addressing a father and a, uh, and a groom. And so the father wouldn't be sinning if he said, okay, you can marry. And the groom and the wife and the, the 
his uh, betrothed wouldn't be sinning if they chose to go ahead and get married. Remember, they were talking about status a lot in this. And it could have been a concern for a believing father in the Corinthian church. Well, if, if marriage is a sin, if it's not okay to get married, if it's better to be unmarried than if I let my daughter get married, is it a sin? Because a lot of times marriages were arranged back then. So either way, essentially what Paul is saying is marriage was not a sin. So if a father chose to say, yes, I'm going to arrange this marriage for my daughter, etc., he's not sinning. If the father decided that that wasn't the way things were going to go and God was moving and they were following God's calling and God's commands, that was also okay. They didn't need to get into this concern about status. Is, am I a better Christian if I'm single? Am I a better Christian if I'm married? Well, it all depends. What did God call you to? Did God call you to a life of marriage or a life of singleness? That was the core question. And then he finishes seven by saying, A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And if you think about his last statements there in the context of what he's been saying, Corinth was experiencing a unique distress and he was thinking about dedication to what God had called him to. So in Paul's personal estimation, the widow would be happier if she did not marry. doesn't say she can't. He just thinks she would be happier. And he points out that if, if a widow should choose to be married and her husband has died, that's not a sin she's allowed to. She just needs to make sure that she marries a believer someone that, that holds the same belief system as she has. So Paul comes to his end of his kind of question and answer section seven with that. And essentially, his main point that we can pull from that is that while there were life circumstances that the Corinthians would be wise to consider when making life-altering decisions, the line is God's calling in their life and obeying His commands. Forget the status. Forget, am I more of a Christian if I'm circumcised or less of a Christian if I'm not? Am I more of a Christian if I'm married or less of a Christian if I'm not? Am I more, am I, do I have a higher status spiritually if uh, I'm, I'm a free man or do, or, do, or do I have, how does this work? And Paul says all of those things, while it was important that the Corinthian believers grew spiritually, while well, it was important that those life changes that he's been talking about took place in them as a part of the, the work of God's Spirit, status was not something they needed to consider. Jesus had called all of them out of the past life that they were in to the same place. There wasn't one that was better than another. They were all distracted by that instead of working together and being who God was calling them to be, and missing the point of, well, what was God calling you to? What was God calling them to? And so the, the main points for us to take home and think about this week are, we need to know what God's calling is for our lives. Doesn't mean that we're all called to the same thing, doesn't mean that we're all called necessarily to go and do what would be considered a formal type of ministry, but what is God calling us to? But see, He's calling us all to something. His Spirit is, is, is active and at work in us, just like we, we listen to the story about the woman in India that was involved in idolatry and worshiping all these different things. She heard God calling her to relationship, Right? And she responded. They responded to the moving and working of God in their lives. And as a result, her husband was delivered and set free. And as a result, God provided for them to pay for the debt and turn it into a testimony. What if in our Western culture, where we're so removed from where it's easy to mask our needs, where it's easy to be distracted, where it's easy to find other outlets to address things. What if we were brave enough 
that we took that step of faith. I mean, you think about it. She went to that congregation, or I'm sorry, to that meeting place and told God that they were going to go away and they were going to find a job and they were going to pay back that debt. And if God worked that out, she was going to come back and she was going to tell people about it. When was the last time we prayed a prayer like that? That we were willing to step out on faith and say, God, what are you calling me to? And then we were willing to let God's Spirit spirit carry us through to do it and turn it into a testimony for His kingdom. I don't imagine working in that brick factory was easy. So I'm not saying that like it's, it, it, it's all, the path is all roses and because God's leading us and God's working that all of it is easy, but God did it. And not only the Bible, but history is full of stories where God did stuff just like that. I remember when I was a teenager in school reading a book about Hudson Taylor and prior to him going to uh, China as a missionary, he had decided he needed to know that he could move God's hand when he prayed, that when he prayed, God would answer. And uh, the, his employer was late paying him, and he needed the money. And so he had decided that instead of saying something to his employer, he was going to pray about it because he wanted to know, hey, if I'm going to this foreign country out in the middle of nowhere where I'm going to have real needs, I need to know that I, I can pray to God and God's going to move. And he didn't say anything. And if I remember the story right, his employer left. And then his employer came back and it's like, oh, I forgot to pay you. Or the story of George Mueller, who had an orphanage in England and had situations where they had no food and would pray. And like the milk cart had a wheel that broke and they had milk for breakfast because the guy had to do something with it or the baker that God woke up to bake bread that night so because that's what God called him to do and he brought it and gave it to him. They didn't have food. So it's not just stories in the Bible where God moves miraculously and does things. He's done it throughout history. He's still willing to do it today. Are we willing to hear God calling to our hearts saying, look, this is what I'm asking you to do and believe and trust for Him to do it. And then for us to remember that God's will is more important than our works. And what I mean by that is they were all caught up in, I need to be like this so that I can have a better status. I didn't God's will. What was God's will? It wasn't specifically what they were doing. It was what was God's will. And if we remember those two things, what is God calling us to do and obeying God's will and His commands, then He's going to lead us the way we need to be. He's going to bring the change where the change needs to be. He's going to help us to stay firm in places where we don't need to change. He's going to grow us and shape us to be who He's calling us to be if we keep those two keys in mind. And that's essentially what Paul was saying to the Corinthian believers here, is in all these situations you're asking about, remember these things and let God guide you in the decisions you make. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. We ask that your spirit would uh, teach us, would grow us, and shape us to be who you're calling us to be, Lord, that you would give us the courage, Lord, to hear your voice and to obey the things that you call us to do. That, Lord, we would have the opportunity to share testimonies of your faithfulness, of your goodness, of your love and your mercy and your grace with each other and with those that we come in contact with. That your gospel would be proclaimed in every area of our lives, Lord. We ask that you would continue the work that you started in us, bringing it to uh, completion by your Spirit, and that you would receive all the glory and honor and praise for what you do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been joining us online today, 
and you have a question about the sermon series or uh, the sermon today or just a journey of faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at one of the methods on the screen. We would love to be a part of that journey with you. I thank you again. Come out of sadness from wherever you are.